Rob, I appreciate uh, your being with us. I know that uh, you right now in particular with the uh, release of this film um, about your experience, uh, Dark Dark Waters, uh, released your experience in this uh, case with DuPont, uh, has, has got you pretty busy. So I appreciate the time. Let's just, if you would, I mean, recount to us what the the origins of this were, because I, I don't think people appreciate just how long of a saga this really is. Sure. And, you know, thanks. Thanks for having me on. You know, we're talking about um, a story that really began over 20 years ago, the fall of 1998, uh, when I had a gentleman call me from West Virginia uh, telling me about cows dying on his property. And at the time, you know, I was working at uh, my law firm in Cincinnati, where I was primarily representing corporations and including a lot of big chemical companies. So I was you know, actually working sort of on what you would call the defense side. Um, and so this was not the kind of case that I typically handled, but he was telling me that he was uh, having all kinds of problems with his cows. He had hundreds of cows that were dying. He, he was seeing white foaming water dead deer, all kinds of problems with wildlife in the area. And could I just take a look at what he had? And, you know, I frankly had no idea what he was talking about, but then he blurted out the name of my grandmother, that he had gotten my name from my grandmother. My mom's family had had grown up in the area. This is right outside Parkersburg, West Virginia, along the Ohio River. Um, So when I heard that he had been referred to me through my grandmother, I, I said, sure, Bring all your information, bring it on up, we'll take a look. And that was um, fall of 1998, and he came up to our offices in Cincinnati, and we watched his videotapes that went back several years and looked at all his photographs, and, and it was pretty clear there was something really bad going on, something really wrong. Uh, we saw um, de- de- uh, animals with deformities, with black teeth, tumors, dead wildlife in the area, white foaming water coming out of a discharge pipe. So, you know, it looked like something we could help them with. We would pull the permits and, and look at what kind of hazardous materials were dumped in this landfill, and we thought we could we could get to the bottom of it pretty quickly for them. And that was, that was 21, you know, 20 years ago. We had no idea at the time that when we took that case on, uh, it would actually lead to the discovery of a completely unregulated um, virtually unknown chemical that was in the water called PFOA. Um, and it's now um, we've been working on that and trying to bring attention to what we've learned about this chemical for the last 20 years. All right. So it's a PFOA. Give us the um, I mean, I think um, uh, to some extent, I mean, we've uh, talked about this on this show uh, over the years, but give us a, a sense of what the, what this chemical uh, is it was um, it's a chemical that was basically sold to DuPont at one point as a way of making non stickware pans. Right. Correct. We're, we're talking about a chemical that was invented right after World War Two. Um, you know, it did not exist on the planet prior to the prior to World War Two, um, uh, really invented by the 3M company. Um, and came out, um, you know, before we had decades, we're talking decades before there was a U.S. EPA, which didn't even form until 1970. And this chemical, um, completely synthetic, man-made chemical that had an unusually strong chemical bond, carbons attached to a fluorine, which made it extremely um, um, it's, it's a stable compound, hard to break down, uh, but which made it very useful for certain manufacturing processes. It was used as what they call a, a surfactant. And DuPont um, discovered you know, that it was particularly useful in their manufacturing of Teflon. And so they began buying it from DuPont as early as 1951 and had large quantities of it shipped from 3M in Minnesota down to Parkersburg, West Virginia, where they used it in, in making Teflon at what was really the world's largest Teflon manufacturing facility in Parkersburg, uh, right along the Ohio River. Now, uh, we should say you, um, you, you've described this as uh, being incredibly durable, the, the chemical, having uh, bonds that have a very short half-life. It's a, it's a chemical that was uh, invented after World War II. Um, but my understanding is that I've never met probably a human being who doesn't have some of this in their blood. 
Yeah, you know, and uh, this the same unique chemical structure that made it so useful for various industrial processes um, also made it extremely troublesome um, from an environmental and health perspective. Um, you know, the companies uh, realized that this particular chemical structure, it had a chemical bond, this, ca- this carbon fluorine bond made it almost impossible to break this chemical down. So when, when it was released out into the environment, it would essentially stay there forever. You hear uh, it referred to now as forever chemical because uh, once it's out in the environment, it, it doesn't break down under natural biological conditions. So not only does it get out into the environment and stay in our environment, in our water, in our soil, but it also has an unusual ability of being absorbed into living things. And uh, when it gets into these living things, it gets basically sticks to the blood. Uh, So we're talking about a chemical that is extremely persistent, you know, will stay out there for long periods of time, but also would accumulate it. It gets into our blood, and even the smallest amounts will build up to higher and higher levels over time. Um, and so, you know, the companies realized this decades ago, you know, that this chemical would not only stay in the environment, but if people were exposed to it, it would get in and stay in people and build up. And then, unfortunately, they also started realizing it was uh, toxic, it had all kinds of toxic effects, in laboratory studies. In fact, um, DuPont um, even internally classified it as a confirmed animal carcinogen in the 1980s um, and started monitoring workers and seeing cancer increases in workers. Um, And, you know, unfortunately, all this information we've been talking about, uh, most of it was unfortunately kept within internal company documents and the public that was being exposed to this chemical in their air, in the water, in, in, in products, um, you know, wasn't told. Uh, and the government regulators really weren't told. It wasn't until our litigation, you know, for this farmer in West Virginia where we discovered, um, you know, this information in internal documents. And I started trying to make that information available to the public and to the EPA as early as 2001, trying to, to warn that we're looking at a massive public health threat here, okay. talking about a chemical that's getting out into the environment and into people on a massive scale, worldwide scale. So now we know that it was so uh, dangerous that at one point 3M decided we, we don't want to be in this business anymore. And they um, but but prior to that, they had told DuPont that there was a specific way they had to dispose of this because it was such a um, what you call a forever chemical. What was that that they told them before we go to the break? What was it that they sure. told them? And uh, what did DuPont end up doing instead? Yeah, 3M actually provided instructions to DuPont when it provided this chemical to them, um, basically warning them uh, not to dispose of it into waterways. And that the, you know, not to dump it out into the ground and the, the only proper way really to get rid of it was to incinerate it. And unfortunately, DuPont did not uh, uh, abide by those guidelines and they instead continued to dump it into the ground into unlined pits around their plant in West Virginia where it seeped into the groundwater and discharged it directly out into the Ohio River and into the air for decades. A farmer came to you. You were at the time a lawyer that would more or less defend chemical companies. You took this case by this farmer uh, because he was referred to you by your grandmother. And um, I'm curious, before we get into like the, the process of how we went from that one case uh, in uh, West Virginia um, to uh, the ultimate case that um, uh, caused DuPont to, to pay an enormous sum for the damage that they had uh, incurred. Well, I'm curious as to like your personal, um, the dynamic of you having had defended some of these companies to becoming a, a an attorney for a plaintiff against these companies. Like what, what was, was, it, was there any drama involved in that or was it just like, well, it's another job. <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, that presented a number of its own challenges, as as you can imagine, and you see a lot of them. Uh, you see a lot of that portrayed in the movie Dark Waters, and I go into a lot of that detail as well in the book Exposure. But you know, 
once I started digging in to these documents and once we started realizing that we were looking at, you know, contamination that went far beyond just this uh, one farmer and his family's property. But, you know, we were looking at contamination of the entire community's drinking water and that it was contamination that was likely all over the country and in the blood of Americans everywhere. Um, you know, it, it, I, I began to realize I might be one of the only people outside of the company that was had seen these documents. The government wasn't aware. The public wasn't aware. And, you know, I really began to view this as a, a public health threat that we really needed. We had an obligation uh, to, to alert the public that this was happening and to do what we could, given the, the information we had and likely others didn't have, you know, to, to try to do what we could. To, to get this out of the water there and to alert the rest of the country as to what was happening. And luckily, I was at a law firm, Taft, Stathenius, and Hollister, where I am still there. It's now my 29th year um, that uh, look, looked at this same information and agreed, you know, that this, this was bad. And this was something that we were going to take on and we were going to make sure uh, was properly addressed, and and they they, and they stuck with it for for many many years, uh, you know, uh, because this was a long process. Um, so it, I was fortunate to be at a firm that really understood the gravity of what we had uncovered, and was um, you know willing to stand by it for a long period of time. So what so what happened? So you you went in with this uh, one case with the farmer, and then um, you realized that this the, this contamination was not limited to just what this farmer experienced with his his cows, and he passed on. My understanding is of cancer, um, Correct. and and then well, he, he, in, he, yeah, in, in the course of that uh, was it in the course of that settlement there was sort of an unprecedented committee set up that was set out to determine, at least within a certain uh, radius of that uh, DuPont factory, how many people had maybe gotten ill from the, uh, the, the improper disposal of that PF PFOA chemical. That's right. You know, we were dealing with a chemical that had uh, essentially gone under the radar of the regulators for decades. So when we were discovering all this, it was unregulated. And we as lawyers had to figure out how do we get this out of the water? How do we get relief for these people when it, it, we're not going to be able to really do it through the regulatory system, through the governmental system? We had to do it, and, um, you know, as lawyers trying to figure out how we can do it um, you know, through the legal system. And despite everything we were seeing in the company's own documents about the toxicity, the, the potential health effects, we still had the company denying um, the, the, the results of those studies that, that presented any risk. So we were able to eventually reach a settlement with DuPont in 2004, where we agreed that both sides would sit down and pick completely independent scientists who would look at all of the data not just what was out there in the published peer-reviewed literature, a lot of which, you know, had been unfortunately sort of controlled um, by the companies, but all of the internal studies as well. And not only look at the existing data, but do new studies. Look at what this chemical was actually doing to the people drinking it in those communities. This was something that really had never been done before to our knowledge. We weren't really sure, you know, how long it would take or how many people would even participate. Right. We ended up, um, there was a payment by DuPont that we ended up using to pay people in the community to come forward, have their blood drawn, and provide information. And we ended up getting 69,000 people in that community wow. who came forward, had their blood drawn, provided medical information, turned it over to these scientists, who then spent the next seven years conducting some of the biggest human health studies ever done on any chemical. Wow. And we were able to then independently confirm through this scientific panel that drinking the chemical was linked with six diseases, including two types of cancer. Wow. And um, and, 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 and that led to, um, I mean, how many people were actually uh, in that, I guess, class of people who were harmed, at least directly, that were established through that process? Well, we had we had estimated that the number of folks in that area that were contaminated by the time of the settlement 
this this chemical had turned up in six different public water supplies on the Ohio and West oh. Virginia side of the river and dozens of people with private wells. We estimated that total area of about 70,000 people. We ended wow. up getting 69,000 of them to participate in the study. So it was a, a incredibly um, uh, huge sampling from within that community. I mean, you had 69 of the 70,000 people uh, participate. So it, it provided unprecedented data in order to finally confirm independently what we had frankly been seeing in the documents from the company for, for many years. Um, we just have about a minute and a half left. I mean, how many plaintiffs uh, ultimately uh, were yeah. involved in this case? Well, once once that uh, those links were came out in 2012, they were announced at the finalized in 2012. We ended up with about 3,500 people in that community that had one of these six diseases, and we wow. ended up um, all those cases were consolidated in a proceeding in Columbus, Ohio. They started going to trial in 2015. We we won all the first three trials, including punitive damages, and during the fourth trial. DuPont finally agreed to settle all of the pending cases for about six hundred and seventy point seven million. That was in twenty seventeen. Wow. Um, oh, we'll just. Uh, uh, so okay, and we just have about uh, about forty seconds left. I'm curious as to um, the that 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 sort of unprecedented epidemiology study. Is that a model for future litigation or for future investigations into uh, these chemicals? Like I say, we've about 30 seconds left. Yeah, I, I think it should be. In fact, I've just filed a new case um, in, in federal court in Ohio, uh, because now that we know about PFOA, we're finding a number of these related PFOS chemicals from the same chemical family in water and human blood. And we're hearing the companies go back to that old refrain, well, there's no evidence showing what they do to human health. So I filed a case on behalf of everyone in the I'm seeking to have it be a class action on behalf of everyone in the country with these chemicals in their blood. And the goal is not money, but the goal is to have the court require these companies to actually set up a new um, nationwide panel to look at all of these uh, PFAS chemicals and, and once again, independently confirm what they are, in fact, doing to us. Do that through independent scientists. Rob Balot, uh, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. 